Good morning from San Antonio, Texas. I'm Daniel Boyce. I'm an astronomer. And uh, today I would like to present work that I've done with my colleague, Professor Dalmida from the University of Sao Paulo, an astrochemist. And our interest uh, has been in planetary science, particularly comets. And uh, we would like to uh, look how our work borders on some of these issues that are very important for origins of life. So today I'd like to talk about phosphorus in cometary volatiles. Um, it's following up some work that we did earlier um, and uh, at, a, at an origins conference in Japan. And uh, uh, outline of our talk would be to give a brief introduction and summarize some of the uh, biochemistry and origins of life issues uh, to make sure that we're kind of all on the same page. It may be very basic for most of you. Then I'd like to talk about detections of phosphorus in space and then get into our work on uh, the chemistry that occurs in the coma of a comet, particularly uh, with, uh, considering the phosphine molecule as a possible parent of uh, uh, and important uh, in the inventory of phosphorus. And then uh, give a little explanation for future directions and summary. So let's go on to the next slide. Well, as we know, phosphorus is uh, it's a not a very abundant element cosmically, the 17th most abundant element. However, in life, it does have a very large enhancement, as we know, compared to the cosmos. So in the table, I've given cosmic abundances. You can see phosphorus, the very last line here, is uh, very low in abundance compared to, some, to the other molecules necessary for life. In cometary volatiles, we have a very recent uh, determination uh, where it is also uh, not a very abundant element, thought not to be a very abundant element in the Earth's crust. It is enhanced somewhat, the 11th most abundant, but in living systems, particularly in a molecule like RNA, it has a ratio of one in 30 uh, or so. So it's greatly enhanced there. So in other words, if we were to think about the population of Earth, given these type of numbers, we would expect to see out of the billions of people on earth, maybe 2000 phosphorus people on earth. There would be 18 on average in the UK, five in London, according to the cosmic abundance, but with 90 or so people attending Norcell, we might expect to see three people in uh, the audience, three phosphorus people in the audience here. Well, uh, we know that uh, although phosphorus is rare, it's essential for life. It's a key ingredient for metabolism, a ATP, ADP, in cell structure, replication, bone structures. However, it's been pointed out that in the, uh, in the origins evolution of life, there's a phosphate paradox where most of the phosphate that we see on earth is extremely stable in uh, phosphates whereas life needs a molecule that can be very rapidly manipulated. So this provides somewhat of a bottleneck. And uh, presently we know of no prebiotic pathways for incorporating a phosphates uh, with their stability into uh, some of the important molecules for life. So since phosphorus is present, uh, is present in biomolecules and very important, seems to be actively scavenged by living systems, um, then the source of phosphorus is also important for origins of life. So how is phosphorus constrained in these matters? And what about extraterrestrial sources for Earth's phosphorus? We like to follow this quote by Louis Pasteur, uh, chance favors the prepared mind. So we consider our work more preparation for looking into these problems that might come up uh, when we have more definitive data concerning uh, uh, some of the phosphorus molecules. The delivery of phosphorus from extraterrestrial sources has been studied for a long time, going back to classic paper by Oro. Uh, the question would be, uh, first of all, uh, is it a solu water soluble type of uh, phosphorus that might easily participate in some kind of uh, uh, 
kind of soup, origins of life, super so, the essence of life. We know that uh, it's also many of the prebiotic phosphorus molecules are found in, thought to occur in interstellar ices. Another question would be, can it survive the impact, uh, physics of impact, the shocks, extreme pressures and temperatures of impact on the surface? And would that even promote maybe some, uh, some uh, production of interesting molecules? And out of all of this, of the extraterrestrial sources, how are comets and uh, uh, meteors and meteorites, asteroids and the like related? What's the role of each one of these? When we look out in space, phosphorus has been found, phosphorus bearing molecules have been found in the interstellar medium and circumstellar shells for many years now. We also see them in the atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn, the giant planets, uh, uh, phosphorus uh, monohydrides observed in the sun, it's ubiquitous in meteorites and found in, uh, phosphates are found in stony meteorites phosphides and iron meteorites, phosphoric acid and murchison, and an IDP uh, particles, uh, inter interplanetary dust particles. Um, there has been work done on the interstellar synthesis of phosphine, uh, making phosphoric oxoacids important for prebiotic chemistry. There's been a tentative de detection in the dust component of Comet Halley using a uh, uh, mass spectrometer there. The molecular form's not known, just the element phosphorus uh, appears to, uh, something appears in the right channel there for phosphorus. Um, the element uh, phosphorus atoms have been found in stardust uh, comet samples and Schreibersite has also been found in these samples. Uh, the spacecraft Stardust that flew by Comet Will 2 and collected a bunch of small little comet dust particles and brought them back to Earth. Uh, but searches for gas phase phosphorus bearing species have been unsuccessful when we uh, look from the ground. Um, upper limits have been set, but the upper limits are not very meaningful because they're higher than the expected abundances. A great uh, progress was made with the Rosetta spacecraft in uh, Comet 67P. We've, uh, we have found that the uh, phosphorus ion was detected, ion mass spectrometer, and also the uh, ion of phosphorus monoxide. And that seems to be the dominant reservoir of phosphorus of those uh, two that have been found. The parent of the atomic phosphorus though is not known. And so in this work, we assumed that a likely candidate could be phosphine. In that case, it would have a very low abundance relative to water of about 0.2% or so. Of course, other simple molecules we might expect to be uh, found in the ices of comets and the nucleus of comets too. So what we did was we applied uh, our years of experience in modeling the, the chemistry that occurs in the gas that's expanding away from the comet. Um, and uh, this model that we've used has a very long heritage. It's a gas dynamic model that looks at the flow of the, uh, of the gas as it leaves the nucleus uh, and solves the conservation equations for mass momentum energy. Um, the, one of the great advantages of our model is we go into great detail in the chemistry that occurs as that gas leaves the comet nucleus, both photolytic and gas phase chemistry in the inner coma where the gases are collisionally coupled. We have a lot of various gas phase reactions that occur. So we might start with 300 plus species, all connected by a network of 3000 or so reactions. And to this, we added a number of reactions now that, uh, that uh, involve phosphorus bearing species. So we try to look at uh, this as a comprehensive model, which uh, we describe as SUICE. ComChem, our comet chemistry model, is just one of the codes that makes up this comprehensive master code. And so we look at the gas as it, uh, as it evolves from the nucleus structure into the coma, and we go all the way out to its interaction with the solar wind as kind of uh, 
figuratively uh, shown in this block diagram. Um, one of the very most important reactions in uh, comets is the photochemistry of molecules, particularly photochemistry of water, since water is the dominant volatile in comets. Uh, so as the comet approaches the sun, uh, within about 3 AU, photochemistry of water is really the primary driver of uh, everything that we see occurring in, in the uh, comet coma. It's the solar ultraviolet that initiates the photochemistry, making really these very highly reactive ions, radicals. And then in this collisionally coupled inner coma, they all interact by gas phase species. What we find also is that energetic electrons caused by photoionization or photodissociative ionization, these hot electrons also uh, participate in electron impact reactions. It can be very important for high production rate comets. So looking in the literature, one of our colleagues, Walter Hubner, has compiled a number of photodissociation uh, cross sections and rates in pH three. Uh, we're able to find information on that and put that into our model. Another important reaction is protonization reactions uh, in this inner coma region. And since water is the most abundant uh, molecule and the ions of water, most abundant, uh, we find that those with higher proton affinities on this right-hand column, particularly ammonia and phosphine, are very willing uh, proton acceptors. So we've uh, so collisions with any of the water-related uh, ions, H2O plus, H3O plus, OH plus, transfer the proton over and make uh, pH four plus, and uh, and say a methyl. Uh, phosphine will also accept a proton too because of its high proton affinity. So what we did was we looked through the databases uh, to accumulate about uh, 100 or so gas phase reactions, photolytic reactions. We also uh, added 30 uh, phosphorus bearing species to our network. And we put this into the uh, code and we let uh, the code evolve a network that involves the chemistry of, of phosphine and how that might re, uh, uh, lead and is related to other phosphorus bearing molecules. And here you can see we've put, uh, I've put in this slide a very small subsection of that reaction network of the 3000 or so reactions for all of the chemical species concentrate on mostly those involving pH three. Now you might think, uh, I really don't have enough time to look at all of the details of, of this reaction network, but one of the great advantages of of our code is it allows us to find the major reaction pathways in the bottlenecks. You can see that the red arrows going away from one of the molecules is a destruction pathway. The blue arrows going into one of the uh, species is a production pathway. And the width of the arrow indicates their significance with the most important reactions being the broad arrows. The thin arrows are an order of magnitude down and the dashed lines are Two orders of magnitude down. So when we look at just those important reactions, we can simplify this to this type of uh, major reactions concerning phosphine. You can see up here, the most important reaction or one of the most important destruction reactions for phosphine is the photodissociation here leading to pH 2 and H. But we see competitive with that in the inner coma is the uh, protonization reaction. So uh, these are about the same importance, which uh, surprised us a little bit. Uh, so we do have to take into, uh, into account gas phase reactions in addition to the photolytic reactions to understand the chemistry of this molecule. So uh, we get a proton donated over to pH three to form pH four plus, and then quickly because there's a sea of electrons that are available, we get a recombination reaction where the electron recombines with this ion, goes to an excited state of phosphine, and then quickly the excited state of phosphine uh, photolytically uh, de-excites, decays back to uh, the uh, uh, ground-based phosphine. So in this case, we have a recycling process that goes on from a protonization reaction to a recombination reaction. 
And uh, we would expect then to see a lot of pH four plus ions in the inner coma. In fact, in our model, we see that it's one of the most abundant ions near the nucleus along with uh, protonated ammonia too. And we would also expect to see some infrared uh, or some uh, uh, photon emissions coming from this excited state, so-called hot bands of phosphine that would exist that could possibly be observed. So we're now going to embark on our study of phosphorus monoxide, the other molecule that was found in the uh, Rosetta data. So we are starting to look at the various reactions that connect together phosphorus bearing uh, species. And we've made this kind of uh, wheel here, reaction wheel that's the beginning of putting that into our network. And my last slide here, I just like to summarize my work and uh, the work that we've performed here and it gives you some idea of where we'll be going into the future. As, uh, uh, as I've shown, our model can successfully account for the relevant chemistry that we would expect it would occur in the, in the uh, comet's coma. We can drive abundances uh, based on this reaction network. We find that it's on the order of about 10 to the minus four relative to water, which is also uh, in good agreement with that observed number that I gave earlier in the talk. Talk. We also can show the scale lengths of phosphine in the inner coma. At one AU from the sun, a comet, uh, uh, a phosphine molecule would have a scale length of about 13,000 to 16,000 kilometers. So we would really have to observe these molecules in very close to the comet nucleus. As uh, we also showed, protonization reactions with water group ions are important for phosphine, but not so important for uh, phosphorus monoxide. Other likely species will be added. We note that uh, phosphine is a super volatile, so if it's in uh, ice form, it would sublimate uh, uh, very much like uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, much, much further from the sun than water. And we've also have to be able to uh, account for electron impact reactions. We're always constrained there somewhat by the laboratory data. Uh, where it's available and where we might be able to use some theoretical ideas to predict what those reaction rates might be. And we're in collaboration with two observers from Kyoto Sengyo Observatory, Hideo Kawakita, Yoshi Shinaka, that uh, are very great observers at the modern telescopic facilities to uh, search for ground-based phosphorus detection. That's one of our goals in the future. So, uh, well, there's my references. I'll go back to the summary slide and I'd uh, be happy to uh, thank you for your attention. And I definitely want to thank the organizers for, um, uh, for putting together this very uh, nice, important conference. And I'd be uh, very happy to, to entertain any questions that you might have.